Good evening, everyone. Very well done. Excellent. I want to welcome you all to the URI Honors Colloquium. Are you ready for the future? Are you feeling readier? I think we're going to have to do a little temperature taking on this issue. I'm Judith Swift of the Communication Studies Department and Director of the Coastal Institute. And my fellow coordinators are Peter Cornillen and Chris Roman, who are both from the Graduate School of Oceanography. And they are but two of the really excellent examples of the faculty and researchers who carry on the tradition of excellence embodied in this, the 50th anniversary of the Graduate School of Oceanography. Let's hear it for GSO. I also want to thank our generous sponsors, in particular the G. Unger Vettelson Foundation and the many sponsors that are listed on the screen behind me. Um, if you are watching through our live cast, I want to welcome you and know, you must know, that you are missing the conviviality of being with the crowd. I also want to warn you that you should not try any of the aversion therapy experiments that are discussed tonight at home or at least not with Ed Boyden's careful direction. Exits are to the rear, the rear sides and the front sides. Restrooms are in the lobby and downstairs. Please turn off pagers. Does anybody have pagers anymore, seriously? Um, pagers, cell phones, any kind of link-ups that you have on your body. Unwrap your cough suppressants and any other goodies. And Prepare yourself. Our speaker is going to entertain questions, so please send them to what is listed on the screen over here, either hcquestion at gmail.com or text to 401-284-7444, or you can fill out a card that was handed to you on the way in, if you like, and those will be picked up at a variety of points throughout the lecture. Um, we'd also appreciate it if you don't use the card and you took one, can you drop them off with uh, Jason back there on the way out? Jason waved to everyone. They will turn their necks, which is one of the brilliant things about anatomy, that we can all do that. Uh, we only edit questions for the sake of brevity, or if more than one arrives with the same topic and they can be combined. The other thing that we're asking tonight, for those of you who are out there watching on livecast, is could you email hcquestion at gmail.com with a subject line of lowercase the word survey, survey in lowercase. Uh, make note of where you're watching from, like you could say Wakefield, if you are a student or you are a uh, lifelong learner or you are an agoraphobic, or any number of things that might have led you to use the live cast. There's nothing like a good agoraphobia joke, I feel. Um, the other thing is that you could let us know if you are an honors student. Um, are you required to watch this as part of a class? The reason we're asking is because we're trying to figure out who out there is watching and how many. We typically get about 400 people on the live cast. But that's hits. That's not necessarily, it could be a class. In one case, we, we learned of a class that was watching with, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 people. So it helps us to understand what the numbers are through livecast. So if you would do that, again, that's uh, hcquestion at gmail.com with the subject line of survey in lowercase. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention very, very quickly is that we have an exciting, and this is a great time to announce this, we have an exciting new program that's beginning shortly. Um, it's an interdisciplinary neuroscience graduate program. Uh, here at the University of Rhode Island, students can begin to apply now. It is officially launched on the 6th of December, and if you want information about the program, you contact the graduate school here at the university. So that's very, very exciting to be able to announce that at night when we have someone with such incredible expertise here to talk with you. 
I want to remind you that on November 8th, we have cognitive scientist Deb Roy and media researcher Joanna Blakely in a panel on social media. And then to move on to this evening's business. To introduce this evening's guest, we have Sean Cunningham. Sean is an honors student who has been responsible for the trailers you have seen that exist on the web. Remember the one, if those of you who were here last week, the one that we showed um, about Ed Boyden's work. Um, Sean has developed all of those. If you haven't watched them, go on the website and take a look, okay? And um, our opening teaser that you watched as well. He's but one fine example of URI's exceptional honors students. And as a double major in philosophy and political science, Sean can help you to deconstruct the movement to occupy Plato's cave. So, Sean. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Tonight we'll hear from Ed Boyden, a Benesi career development professor and associate professor of biological engineering and brain and cognitive sciences at the MIT McGovern Institute and the MIT Media Lab. Professor Boyden has three degrees from MIT in, in electrical engineering and physics and a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University. He leads the Synthetic Neurobiology Group, which develops tools for controlling and observing the dynamic circuits of the brain and uses these tools to understand how cognition and emotion arise from the brain, as well as to enable systemic repair of intractable brain disorders such as epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic pain. The tools his group has invented include a suite of optogenetic tools that are now used by hundreds of groups around the world. Uh, in activating and silencing neurons with light. He has also contributed to over 250 peer-reviewed papers, current or pending pa patents, and articles, and has received numerous rewards, including the NIH, NIH Director's New Innovator Award and the NSF Career Award. I could go on and try to further impress you with his achievements, but I'd rather give Professor Boyden the floor so he can impress you with his ideas. So please join me in welcoming Ed Boyden. All right. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and the invitation to come and speak. And uh, we're going to try and talk today about uh, one of what I think is one of the most both philosophically challenging and also uh, clinically potentially beneficial areas in uh, bioengineering now, which is to try to engineer the brain and the computations being performed by the brain. And I'll begin by telling you some examples of what's ha happening today you know, with human patients and uh, uh, in the study of the mind. And they'll talk about how this is going to go in the future as people try to control the very precise brain computations that happen um, at the scale of the circuits uh, within our skulls. And part of why I think engineering the brain is a priority is because one of the best ways of showing that we understand something is to be able to uh, engineer it, to fix it, uh, to improve it. Uh, this is a quote from Richard Feynman, the quantum physicist, uh, when he was uh, uh, at the end of his life, uh, when he was talking about uh, apparently what he approached physics, uh, the philosophy with which he approached physics, uh, which was to really try to make very clear and understandable explanations uh, that allow people to really synthesize uh, and test ideas through creating things. Um, he helped, for example, uh, he interned uh, long after he won the Nobel Prize uh, at a supercomputer company trying to see if they could find ways to model uh, the computations being performed by matter in a computer. So. The brain, of course, has been studied for a very long time. And we're going to start off by talking about some of the things that have been found uh, in the interaction between uh, the world and the brain. And then we're going to talk about how we're delving into this uh, in the current day and age. And I think one of the big issues, in addition to the obvious question, which is that uh, how does our brain implement our thoughts and our emotions, uh, is also the incredible clinical need that's apparent. Uh, it's been estimated that over a billion people around the globe uh, currently suffer from some kind of brain disorder. And many of these brain disorders uh, are untreatable, and pretty much none of them are completely curable. If you look at the list here, uh, stroke and Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, uh, and vision loss, uh, for a lot of these uh, problems, there's really not anything that can be done. And this is a huge unmet medical need. Uh, in fact, in many parts of the globe, it's been estimated that brain disorders, if not already, will soon become one of the major 
unmet medical needs of any kind. Of course, there's also the question of what the normal brain does. And uh, in some ways, the brain's operation is so close to home that it's easy to miss its constant uh, vigilant operation. I mean, everything that we do or see or smell or eat or every feeling that we feel is being implemented by our brains. And that's one of those things that I think if you really stop and think about it and, and meditate upon it a little bit, uh, it's very striking uh, to kind of try to think about how your brain is, is acting at this very moment or how it acted this morning or how it's going to uh, consolidate your memories to make them more permanent when you're asleep tonight. Now, brain disorders over the last hundred years have seen the advent of treatments based upon neuropharmacology. Um, antipsychotic drugs that allowed schizophrenic patients to leave uh, the asylums where they were confined in the uh, early to mid part of the 20th century. Um, lithium to treat bipolar disorder. Um, antidepressants, of course. These drugs, for the large part, were found uh, by accident. Um, just to pick one or two examples, uh, lithium, uh, which is, is, has long been used as a treatment for bipolar disorder, uh, it was actually uh, by testing the urine from schizophrenic patients in rats um, that this was found because they needed a control for the urine, and so they decided to use lithium urate uh, as a control, and that had an effect. And so the question was uh, on a rat's behavior. And so the question was, is, what is this urine thing doing? It turned out that lithium was actually the, the causative agent. And so uh, that ended up being a treatment uh, that in some incarnations is, uh, is, is, uh, is still having impact for the treatment of, of bipolar disorder. Um, antipsychotics uh, emerged from antihistamines, the, anti the allergy drugs, uh, as people started to explore their use and found out that they had a sedative or calming effect. And over a period of many years, uh, they were used in increasing numbers and allowed a great many people to uh, overcome some of the positive symptoms uh, which are the hallucinations and other problems associated with uh, psychosis and schizophrenia. So part of the, the question has been then, can we discover neurotechnologies that allow us to fix the brain in a principle-driven way, not just relying upon uh, the random walk that takes us through medicine uh, through the centuries, um, but instead trying to find theories of the brain or principles of the brain that we can take to the bank and use them to try to develop better treatments, ideally without side effects. Now, I wanted to give a couple examples of technologies that over the last 10 to 20 years have started to make their way uh, into the treatment of human patients. And one of them that's uh, widely regarded as an incredible success story is deep brain stimulation, the implantation of electrodes in the brain. And I thought there could be no more compelling way to explain this than to show you what a patient is like before and after such a treatment. So we'll show a brief clip. It's only about four minutes long. Uh, but I'll take you through the entire arc from uh, the beginning of the, the problem to uh, the treatment. Uh, deep brain simulation in practice is used very widely for Parkinson's disease. Um, the video that you're going to see is not exactly Parkinson's. It's another disorder called a central tremor, which shares some of the symptoms, uh, but is uh, at its heart a different disorder. have an implanted electrode in their brain to treat some kind of Parkinson's disease or other kind of uh, motor disorder. And it's gotten to the point now where the efficacy and safety of this technology has gotten to the point of impacting psychiatry as well, not just movement disorders, but even uh, conditions like depression. And so uh, in a study that uh, was performed several years ago, um, a brain mapping was done, uh, and people found a hot spot shown by that red dot, where neural metabolism was high in the brain of depressed patients. And these are very severely depressed patients who had failed four or more treatments. And so uh, what this group did was to actually implant then uh, the same kinds of electrodes that you saw in the little video deep into the brain to hit these targets. And they did it on each side of the brain, just to be sure. When they turned on the electrodes, these patients reported changes in mood. They felt calm and light, the void of their existence disappeared. They felt connected to other people in the room. And uh, several of the patients that were treated went into remission. That is, their intractable uh, depressive symptoms that had been untreatable by any means uh, disappeared. And interestingly, from a neural circuit standpoint, thinking about what the actual brain is doing, that overactive area was now back down to normal or even lower in activity. And some of the areas that 
you see, which were blue, that is, that they were beforehand low in metabolism, are now jazzed up. They're now more active. So this is an area where the ability to target points in the brain and to use electricity to change the activity of the brain can remedy neurological or psychiatric disorders. And that's because, at some level, you can regard the brain as made of electrical devices. A couple years ago, um, this was taken even to another level, uh, where a group uh, in New York uh, looked at people uh, in a coma. They had a patient in a minimally conscious state, um, so not responsive, uh, uh, um, had a traumatic brain injury, and um, did not uh, uh, have his own actions. And they put electrodes into a central part of the brain, which they hypothesized would allow the brain to process information more normally. Um, and amazingly, they were able to restore uh, some degree of, uh, of conscious state. Um, the patient opened his eyes, and he would turn his head when somebody would speak. Uh, he would respond when somebody gave him a, a command, or he would even be able to do intelligible verbalizations um, and to use objects for their uh, intended uses. So if you think about it, this is really quite striking. Um, this is a person who is unconscious, and he's being uh, restored with some degree of responsivity and maybe even consciousness, although they were careful to avoid that word in the, in the paper, um, you know, with all its uh, uh, laden terminology. Um, but nevertheless, uh, some degree of ability to function, uh, despite the fact that, that uh, before he was not able to, to do anything. So the ability to use electricity uh, to target a region of the brain that either needs to be um, altered in activity or to try to drive activity, uh, in this case, to kind of reboot the brain, has proven to be a really powerful way to go. Now, a parallel track has also been to non-invasively deliver electrical or magnetic energy to the brain. You can, for example, take a little coil of wire, and if you discharge a current through it very quickly, electrical current through it, it'll make a magnetic pulse. And the magnetic pulse, in the same way that a bar magnet can magnetize iron filings through a sheet of paper, this magnetic pulse will go through the skull and into the brain and can induce neural activity from outside. Interestingly, this methodology of transcranial magnetic stimulation in the US is approved for treating depression as well. You can find targets on the surface, perhaps some of those targets that were underactive in that slide a couple of slides ago, and you can increase their activity. But you can do all sorts of other things as well. This is a really interesting study that came out uh, about a year ago. Um, this is from Rebecca Sachs's group. And what they did was to try to investigate the neural circuits within the brain that process uh, moral judgments. So what you see here is uh, kind of a two-by-two two grid, where um, uh, Grace is taking an action, and the action uh, has an outcome, which could be neutral or negative. So uh, for example, she puts sugar into uh, some coffee, or she puts in a toxin, and her friend either lives or dies. And then there's also what Grace believes. Maybe she thinks the powder sugar, and she puts it into the coffee, and it's sugar, and the friend lives. We would all agree that's you know, not immoral, right? That seems like a moral action. Yeah. If she thinks it's toxic, and puts the toxic thing into the coffee, and, the, and, and her friend dies, that's obviously immoral. And I think most people would uh, conclude that the cross terms um, uh, have to be uh, evaluated. In other words, intentionality matters. If Grace thinks the powder is toxic, and it turns out to just be a harmless sugar, and her friend survives, most people would probably still think that Grace is doing something wrong. So interestingly, there's a part of the brain uh, called the temporoparietal junction. And if you stimulate that part of the brain, then it alters how much people uh, rely upon Grace's beliefs and Grace's intentionalities um, in their moral judgment. Um, in other words, the uh, case where Grace thinks the powder is toxic turns out to be harmless sugar. Um, if you disrupt this part of the brain with a magnetic pulse, then people will be more likely to gauge that as being morally OK. Now, this really gets to a very interesting question that really um, cuts to the heart even of some aspects of you know, how society works and what philosophy tells us about human action. If interrupting part of the brain can change how much people attribute intentionality to uh, uh, you know, a moral outcome, uh, that really suggests that the circuits that are in, in our brains are really involved with computing all these things, and that you can actually perturb them, and it will change how people judge others um, at a moral level. Or here's another example. 
um, you're, there's a way of stimulating the brain that can actually facilitate uh, flashes of insight. Uh, and this was uh, done by a group earlier this year. What they did was to give people puzzles to solve. And you can see a puzzle here where uh, the goal is to take these little matchstick equations. In this case, 3 equals 9 minus 1, obviously not correct. And by moving one matchstick, can you uh, make this equation true? And so in this case, the right thing to do is take the x and shift the mat matchstick over to make it into a v. And now, in Roman numerals, this equation is true. 3 equals 4 minus 1. Now, there are other trick questions that you might play. You know, moving the numbers around to change one number to another is one thing you can do. But you can also demand entirely different kinds of solution. For example, here, 6 equals 6 plus 6. Well, the one way to solve it is to take the plus and make it into an equal sign by taking that math stick and turning it 90 degrees. 6 equals 6 equals 6. And what people found is that if you solve too many of these problems where you try to convert one number into another, it's really hard to shift your mind and to think about non-numeric changes in the equation. So what this group did was to pass a current across the brain. Um, it's very similar in spirit to taking a battery and passing current across the brain through a couple sponges soaked in salt water. And what they found was that when they applied a current of 1.6 milliamps, that um, people were three times more likely to be able to solve a problem that was unlike the kind they were solving before. So this is a fairly large change. A lot of brain stimulation changes are, are fairly small in their effect. But a threefold change you know, is, is quite a lot. Interestingly, there's another way to get a threefold uh, increase in having a flash of insight um, between solving a problem, uh, attempting to solve a problem, and actually doing it. And that's to go take a nap. So uh, I routinely apply that in my own research. <clears throat> so that brings us to the question of what will this look like in the future? Um, especially if you can cause multifold changes in behavior, um, what does this look like in terms of not only medical usage, but, but augmentation? And in all sorts of forms of medicine, you will see trends where as things are tried out, and if they are shown to be safe and efficacious, they end up impacting people beyond the initial uh, audience. Um, you know, for example, uh, deep brain stimulation that you saw being used on people with uh, Parkinson's disease is now being used on people with depression. And I know neurosurgeons who are actually doing deep brain stimulation on, for example, adolescents who have Tourette syndrome, which is not life-threatening. It's socially isolating. People have tics, and they uh, have uncontrolled verbalizations. Um, but it's a, it just shows that deep brain stimulation has gotten to the point now where people are willing to use it for uh, non-life-threatening conditions in, in people who are not adults. Um, the non-invasive stimulation uh, is, is just now making it through the approval process for the clinic. Uh, in some ways, it's taken a longer time to really find out what it's most useful for. Um, but it's interesting to speculate, you know, if an invasive methodology is applied um, uh, to conditions far beyond the initial scope, what will non-invasive methods be used for? And to that extent, if you think about technologies that people have developed that really have no purpose beyond changing the brain, um, this has had a long and storied past in human history. So if you think about um, alcohol or meditation, um, two technologies, as it were, um, that change the brain but, uh, uh, but don't necessarily have a lot of extra uh, external benefits, um, this uh, kind of innovation has gone back many thousands of years, perhaps 8,000 years, uh, some historians think. And if you look at tea and coffee, um, these are more recent innovations. Um, maybe tea's been... Uh, making its way into the bellies of humans for 3,000 years. And coffee is a relative newcomer to the block, only 500 years old um, in terms of its being used. But it shows the kinds of things that people do, in this case, to increase alertness um, or to, uh, in some ways, augment cognition in, in the face of tiredness. And so these are technologies that are far, far older than other neurotechnologies, but I think we have to consider them neurotechnologies in their own right, um, given that their main impact is to change brain performance. Now let's go back to this slide here. We've talked so far about the successes, but it's true that a lot of uh, need exists and that we need to develop better technologies that can treat disorders without side effects. And part of the problem, I think, is that the complexity of the brain is such that we have to confront the circuitry of the brain at the microscale. So far we kind of regard the brain as something that we could think about with its regions and its macroscopic properties. But given the incredible need, here's some comments from, for example, the director of the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health. There's almost nothing that gives any hope for a transformation in the treatment of mental illness. 
not, not exactly a great uh, vote of, of optimism there. You know, the need for better treatments for neurological and psychiatric disorders is vast. For some disorders like Alzheimer's, no treatment exists. And if you look at what people are doing, these are tough problems to crack. If you look at the clinical approval success rate for brain drugs, it's only 8%, 92% failure rate. And it takes about 10 years, uh, some of the longest approval times that exist now. And then finally, the cost to take a drug through clinical development is $850 million. So if you add up these numbers, this is a very tough problem. How can you start to target these incredible dysfunctions without having side effects? Now, if only we could treat the brain like a computer, something that we could reprogram and fix, and, under and understand the mechanisms at a level which allows us to repair it. In order to do that, we have to go back to the brain and, and zoom in a bit. Because the last 100 years of neuroscience have taught us a lot about the brain. For one thing, they've taught us that the components that make up the brain, neurons and other cell types, appear in an incredible diversity of shapes, forms, uh, wiring uh, activities, um, and molecular compositions. And so if you look in the brain, you actually will find an incredible density of the cells that make up the brain. A single cubic millimeter of brain tissue has 100,000 cells, each with 10,000 connections. That means in a cubic millimeter, you have something like a billion connections between the cells in that tiny, tiny piece of brain. So how do we make sense of all this? Well, one idea would be, what if we could record what's going on in all of these cells, and if we could control them? Maybe we could figure out which cells, when controlled, would fix a brain disorder. And by monitoring the brain at the cellular level, we could try to figure out what kinds of processes happen within. Now, one of the big problems, of course, is the incredible heterogeneity of the brain. We don't have a parts list for the brain. The number of different kinds of cells in the brain is staggering. These are some of the tiny inhibitory cells that exist in the brain, and they're amongst the neurons that are compromised in disorders such as schizophrenia. And yet, their properties are only starting to be quantitated at a molecular level uh, and at a physiological level. Um, there are all sorts of different cell types, perhaps thousands of different kinds of cell, each with its unique morphology and its molecular composition. Uh, and also, they all change in different ways in disease states to make things even more complex. Now, there's good news as well. One of the pieces of good news that lots of people are taking advantage of is that, to some level, we can ignore some of the complexity of the brain and regard the neurons as electrical computers. The neurons of the brain may have different morphologies and appearances and molecular compositions, but one of the common currencies of the brain is electricity. They integrate information from their neighbors and their partners as electrical signals, they compute using electricity, um, and they also transmit their, their messages, some of them very long distances, like down our spinal cord, using electrical pulses. So, if we can observe those electrical pulses, and if we can control those electrical pulses, then it goes a long way towards understanding how these different cells in the context of the circuit govern its computations, and how they go awry in brain disorder contexts. So, really the goal, I think, is to see if we can control these cells. Now, earlier we talked about pharmacology, the use of drugs to treat brain disorders. And if you think about it, if a drug is washing in over the brain and affecting uh, everything in its path, you might actually get neurons that are being altered that you don't want to be altered. And that might be one of the contributors to side effects. What you might want to do is you'll activate some of these neurons embedded in this dense matrix, but not its neighbors. If only so we could figure out which cells are the most important ones for treating a disorder. So what that means is that we really need new technologies. We need to have ways of activating and observing all these elements in the brain. In some total in the human brain, perhaps 100 billion cells or more, each again with tens of thousands of connections, perhaps. So one of the ideas that we put forth about how to do this is to try to take advantage of the fact that neurons, as we discussed, are electrical computers. So if you have a neuron, like this little cell in the lower left-hand corner here, and if you can install a solar panel in it that converts light into electricity, then you could control that neuron with light. And if all the other cells nearby didn't have that solar panel, they would not be affected by light. This would allow you to do that first thing we talked about. Could we control brain activity by uh, activating or silencing certain cells and not others? This would be very useful. For example, if you could turn off a cell, you could see whether removing it from its, the functional circuit could help treat a disorder. Or you might find that by activating a certain cell, you could jazz up its activity and help repair a disorder. This could both lead to new kinds of prosthetic, like the deep brain simulators that we talked about before, 
Or it could highlight that a certain cell really should be a new drug target, that people should go make drugs that target that specific kind of cell and not the other ones nearby. Now, this is only part of the problem. You have to get neurons to become light sensitive. You have to install the solar panels in the cell so that light turns electricity and electricity controls the neuron. But you also have to get light into the brain. And it turns out that the brain doesn't have any pain sensing neurons. You can actually put optical fibers into the brain. And just as that awake patient, you saw that he was having that deep brain stimulator put into his brain while he was fully conscious, uh, we can similarly put optical fibers, which even in, a, in appearance look something like those deep brain stimulators in terms of being long and insertable, and we can put those into the brain as well. In this case, in a mouse model, um, which is a very common thing to do in, in the biomedical research arena. So now we've got to find these solar panels. It turns out that all across the tree of life, different organisms have to sense light in order to, for example, navigate towards the surface of a pond, like the single-celled algae is doing. It's actually doing it because it has an eye spot that senses light and allows it to swim. And so if you zoom in on that eye spot, you actually find molecules in the membrane of that eye spot that have an amazing property. When light hits them, they translocate electrical charges from one side of this little eye spot to the other, much like a solar cell charging up a battery, for example. So if you think about it, that's exactly the magic trick we need in order to make neurons light sensitive. If we have this molecule that converts light into electricity, and we put them into neurons so that those uh, neurons can be controlled, then we shine light on them, the light will hit that neuron, cause the electrical charges to move, and that neuron will be controllable. But if other cells don't have this special molecule, they will remain inert. And so it turns out we're very lucky. This molecule is encoded for in the genome of this organism. And so we can take the little snippet of DNA that encodes for this molecule and transplant into the neuron. You can do this using uh, the mechanisms of gene therapy, which are now being used uh, increasingly in clinical trials to try to deliver genes even into humans. Now, amazingly, if you do this, something magical happens. This molecule, which was in that eye spot of that algae, it doesn't get trapped in some little part of the cell. It actually ends up on the surface of this neuron. And now if you shine light on this brain circuit, these molecules will convert light into electricity and activate that neuron. But all the other cells around it that don't have this molecule will not be affected by the light. Now, you might ask, how do we get this molecule into some cells and not others? That would be a very good question to ask about now, actually. And so anticipating that, we made this little explanation. So basically, molecules have uh, neurons of different shapes and that have different properties will also differ slightly, at least, in their molecular composition, sometimes very drastically in their molecular composition. So let's consider that little cell that we talked about earlier that's compromised in schizophrenia. That cell will express some genes, but not others. And so if we make a virus that will infect the cells, for example, but only allow the expression of the gene to be activated in this cell type, but in the others it remains inert, then that cell will actually express this molecule and become light sensitive. And now when we bathe the brain in light, only that cell type is manufacturing the molecule. The others don't have that genetic program ready to go, and so they don't actually manufacture the protein and install it. And so that's how we can do the control of one kind of cell in the brain. And that's good news because people are finding more and more cells that are associated with specific disorders. In Parkinson's disease, people have hunted down a very specific population of cells that atrophies deep in the brain. In schizophrenia, once again, this is amongst the, the few kinds of cells that are most implicated, and so on and so forth. Thanks to many years of pathology and histology in the medical profession, people are finding cellular correlates of different neural disorders. So let's explore how this could actually be used to try and figure out what targets in the brain are involved with, for example, addiction. So what we're going to do is put that molecule into different cells of the brain, and we're going to photoactivate the brain and try to figure out, will the photoactivation uh, drive an addiction-like behavior? Will it cause the animal, in this case a mouse model like we talked about before, to do more of whatever it was doing before? And to do that, you can devise a very simple behavior task, not unlike um, the kinds of, of experiments that have been done for many decades in behavioral neuroscience. You can have a box, and in the box there are two spots. One spot, if a mouse goes there, he gets a pulse of light. At the other spot, nothing happens. So what happens is, if um, we are activating a part of the brain that drives a reward or addiction-like phenomenon, then the mouse will think, oh, whatever I was just doing, I should do more of that. And we should see the mouse go to the, light, the lit spot, um, or more precisely, the point in the box where light goes into the brain, 
and avoid the other one. So we can actually do that. Uh, so this is work we're doing in collaboration with the, the Fiorilla group. And what we do is we actually make uh, dopamine neurons. Many of you have probably heard of dopamine uh, as being one of the pleasure centers of the brain. Um, here what we're going to do is to see if an animal will work, work for light. Will the animal go to that spot in order to get a pulse of light? And as you can see, this mouse will go to this little spot and he'll poke his nose into a little optical sensor. And every time he does that, he gets a pulse of light. And he'll go there over and over and over again. He'll never go to the other one. And that verifies this hypothesis that indeed a brief activation of this specific cell can reinforce whatever uh, the brain was doing just before. Now that's really powerful. For example, this might be a good drug target to go for to try to treat addiction. Maybe this specific neuron class, its molecular composition should be treated as something against which drugs should be discovered. And if we target that, maybe we can actually try to block this kind of process or to modulate it in some way. There's another thing, of course, which could be possible, which is that direct optical prosthetics could be developed, not unlike the DBS implants we talked about before for deep brain stimulation, but with light as a causative agent. I'll talk about that later. In the meantime, though, the ability to go through the brain and activate different points one by one can be very powerful. You can screen through the brain, looking for targets that, when modulated, change a disease state for the better. And so this idea of taking high-throughput screening which you may have heard of in the context of drug discovery, and moving it into the living intact system is a very powerful one. So here's an example of an array of optical fibers, each of them coupled to its own little light source. And all of this is very inexpensive, thanks to the fact that you know, the internet and everything, uh, has, uh, and telecommunications have driven um, optics and, and optical uh, information transmission through fibers. So in this case, we have a little array of fibers that tie all the part of the brain, at least in mice, that contributes to memory. And so the idea is that we could actually go through the brain and shut off different parts of this to look for circuits that might augment memory or suppress it. Now, it turns out that throughout the tree of life, there are many molecules that convert light into electrical energy. And so we've now found these molecules uh, to be useful in the brain from pretty much every kingdom of life except for, for animals. Um, we have different light sensors, of course, that turn light into other kinds of signal rather than direct electrical signal within the molecule. And so by surveying the tree of life, we found all sorts of molecules that do interesting things. For example, we found molecules that do the opposite of what we just talked about. Instead of translocating electricity so in the fashion to activate cells, you can actually shut down cells. They move charged particles in the opposite direction. This is quite useful. For example, imagine a case where you have um, an epileptic seizure. Wouldn't it be great if we could shut down that overactive part of the brain just for the amount of time that it takes to delete that seizure activity? And that's what uh, we and other groups are now trying to pursue by taking these molecules that do the opposite thing, that convert light into neural silencing. And now when you shine light onto a pocket of the brain or a piece of the brain, neurons will be turned off. But when the light goes away, the neurons will go back to the normal state. To put into context, very often when epilepsy drugs fail, people who have intractable seizures will undergo permanent neurosurgery where part of the brain is removed. And many times, uh, the seizures will relapse afterwards anyway, and many times uh, removing the brain that's involved is not possible because it would result in um, problems that, uh, from any perspective, might be considered to be even worse, like losing speech or motor areas. What we hope is that we could actually deactivate those areas that contribute to a seizure right at the moment when we need to, and not have to permanently delete neural circuits from the brain. Now, might this look like a therapeutic path? To be upfront, it's early days. But as we talked about, and now let's put some numbers on it, perhaps a quarter million people have some kind of implanted electrical stimulator. As we talked about earlier, maybe 70,000 people or more have deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's and other motor disorders. But over 100,000, perhaps 150,000 people have cochlear implants that are implanted, sometimes even very young in life, because if you don't hear when you're young, um, it can impair the development of the brain. Um, uh, cochlear implants for the restoration of hearing for people who've lost their hearing uh, due to um, genetic or uh, other um, uh, incidents that have affected the sensory cells in our ears that convert sound into things that the brain can understand. Now, we have to get this snippet of DNA into the cell as well. And to do that, it is a gene therapy, which has had its ups and downs. But there's a kind of virus called AAV, which actually is pretty common. Perhaps most of us in this room already have it, and there are no symptoms. And 
This safe virus has been used in many hundreds of patients to deliver genes into the body, even in the brain and in the eye, in order to restore gene function in cells. And so far, um, the adverse events that are due to the virus um, have been pretty much zero. Sometimes the payload being delivered uh, would have an effect, but the virus itself does seem to have been borne out in its safety. And so the final thing, of course, is we have to figure out, are these molecules from algae and all these other uh, organisms throughout the tree of life, are they themselves safe? Perhaps the immune system will react against them, or perhaps over time they will not be well tolerated by neurons and other cells in the body. So the question really, I think, boils down to an empirical one, what happens? And so now we and many others are actually doing preclinical pre tests of these molecules to see can they be safely tolerated and expressed in the body. Let's talk about one example in the context of blindness. So this is the retina in the back of the eye, um, zoomed in on the right. And what you can see on the right-hand side are the photoreceptor cells. Those are the cells that capture light and transform uh, the light information into something that the brain can understand. The information is then relayed through a whole series of neurons um, until it is transmitted into, uh, from those last, that last layer, the ganglion cells, into the brain. And there are many forms of blindness that perhaps affect 15 million or more people where the photoreceptors die or atrophy. Now, if that happens, here we are zoomed in on that retina. We've blown it up a bit so we can see uh, the cells in detail. The photoreceptors now at the top, and then the cascaded layers to go to the brain going downwards until the ganglion cells, again, at the bottom, relay the information to the brain. So the photoreceptors, if they're gone, poses a dilemma. There's not really anything for a, a small molecule or a drug to, to bind to. Um, there's, I mean, what would you do? So as, as might be all too obvious, since light can still get into the eye, one of the ideas is to take these light-sensitive molecules that we've been talking about, take the gene for them, and deliver them into some of these other spared cells in the eye. The good news is that many of these other cells will live for a long time after the photoreceptor cells die. And we can basically convert that layer of cells into a camera. Those cells will be able to capture light, and because they're still in the pipeline to transfer information to the brain, they can recapitulate the functions that were lost when the photoreceptors were gone. So that's what we're going to show you here. So this is all, again, in mouse models. Um, this is a mouse, and uh, he's blind. Um, there are many blind mice, as you might guess. Um, and uh, it turns out that many of the mice that you find at pet stores are blind. Uh, they've been inbred to the point where uh, they don't see. Uh, and their retina degenerates in a very similar fashion to the way that human patients with, say, retinitis pigmentosa or age-related macular degeneration will experience degeneration. So this, the goal of this experiment is for this blind mouse to solve a maze. And the maze has six arms that go in different directions. And the goal is to crawl out of the thin film of water onto a little platform. In this case, the platform is underneath the lamp. And mice are smart, so they solve this over time by figuring out where not to go um, or learning how to search the arms of the maze one by one, but they're not using vision to do it. They can't tell one arm from the other. The water's in the, in the maze as an old neuroscience trick dating back many decades um, so that the mouse will move around. Um, mice like to swim, but they like to sit on platforms more. So this mouse is blind maybe a month or two before this experiment and received one dose of that light-sensitive molecule encoded for with that AAV virus I told you about before. And now you can see that the mouse can directly go towards the light and get out onto the platform. Now, does this prove that the mouse can see in the way that you or I see? It's not clear that's the case. But what it does show is that these mice can make cognitive use of visual information, whereas before they could not. They could only solve the maze by trying every single combination, um, which is not what you would do if you could see. So it's early days, but one hope is that uh, it would be possible to take these light-sensitive molecules and use them to make the blind retina capable of seeing again. Now, we're a technology group. Uh, we've distributed these tools to actually it might be up to almost 600 groups now or more um, in order to work on addiction and blindness and these other problems. And so one of the things that's emerged is just how awesomely complicated the problem in the brain is. Have we learned anything from the entire process at the meta level? Have we learned anything from our search for these tools that allows us to generate new tools. Because 
there's still an incredible amount of complexity of the brain. How do we know if we find a neural target what the molecules are in those cells? How can we figure out how to record the activity in these cells? We haven't talked about any of that. And this turns out to be a big problem. It's very hard to make good tools that work in the brain. The brain is a mess. It's complicated, it's dense, it's fragile. And so to develop a tool, you have to be kind of good at optimizing your luck. And so we've actually developed uh, what we call uh, luck optimization processes uh, in our group, which is to really try to go after the entire scope of what is available to us as tools. I mean, if you think about it, we had to, to implement the last couple things we told you about, learn about and implement new technologies based upon optics and genes and viruses and uh, you know, algae swimming around in ponds and genomics. We didn't invent any of that, of course. But by looking for different possible sources of solutions and then trying to figure out what are the problems we could tackle with them, a new kind of job has emerged, which I like to call the curator. It's somebody who can speak the languages of all these solution domains and problem domains and connect different areas of the solution to different areas of the problem. And so this is a really difficult thing to do. We've been trying to train people on how to be curators, how to get people to communicate, how to get people to understand the process of problem solving. And what we found is that it's important for this to be a really global enterprise. At this point, uh, one of the most important things to do if you want to optimize your luck and to tackle these incredibly complex problems is to always avoid the limits of being a fixed set of people. You really need to be able to reach out to any field, you know, material science or biochemistry, and to bring those tools to bear upon the complexity of the brain. And so um, these are just some of the universities that we are collaborating with people at in this search to try and figure out what technologies can we apply to solving brain disorders, or who has a brain disorder in mind and has a hypothesis about how to go after it, but needs somebody to figure out the tools that would allow people to solve it. So, in some ways, a lot of what the curator does is also uh, a motivational one. We need to find solution people who are obsessed with solving impactful problems, and to find problem people who are desperate enough for new tools that they'll tolerate the many mistakes that the solution people feed them. Um, and it also requires people to really have the motivation to collaborate. Something that I spend a lot of time talking about is really that it's not a zero-sum game. You know, the problems of the brain are, from our current perspective, nearly infinite. And frankly, if we, if we do solve the brain, whatever that means, um, it'll change how we think about thought and emotion and so on in such a way that probably society would be fundamentally changed in any case. I'll just give one example. I could talk all day about this, but one example is probably better than many. Earlier we talked about this idea of if we could screen to the brain, activating cells bit by bit, to look for the part of the brain that's most impactful at remedying a disease in an animal model of a disease. Wouldn't it be great if we could then make a drug that would just affect that one kind of cell and not all the others? But to do that, we have to be able to figure out what the molecules are in that cell, because drugs, of course, bind molecules. They don't bind abstract regions. So to do that, we collaborated with the forest group at Georgia Tech, um, a mechanical engineering group, and set out to devise a robot that could actually extract single cells deep, deep in the brain and figure out what their molecular composition is. And we have now accomplished that uh, by bringing to bear mechanical engineering, ideas on neurosurgery, um, and intuitions about neuroscience, as well as a lot of knowledge about the electrical properties of the brain. This robot actually sees neurons by looking electrically at its environment. It doesn't have a camera. Instead, as it lowers the little cell extractor into the brain, it's actually monitoring the electrical properties of its environment. To go further than that probably is beyond the scope of the talk but it highlights the kind of interdisciplinariness or almost extreme interdisciplinariness that's required to bring the solutions to bear upon these really complex problems. And so now we're hopeful that we could take the ability to screen through the brain and find the circuits and use this robot to convert those circuits into molecules in order to find drugs that can bind those molecules. We're also trying very hard to get business uh, going. We talked earlier about how you know, the path to taking a drug out of the lab into the clinic is nearly a billion dollars, and the failure rate is 92%. This doesn't sound like a very good business to be in. And so one way to think about that is that's, a, that's an opportunity for new people to enter who have radically different ways of thinking about it. So we started um, a business class, uh, which is in collaboration with the MIT Sloan School of Management, which tries to get folks interested in inventing technologies and then taking them out into the world and figuring out how to deploy them in a self-sustaining way, which is not a trivial thing to do. 
And we've now taught this course for five years. Um, and we've now had some students who've, who've taken the course and who've gone on to successfully develop new strategies for tackling brain disorders. One of our students, for example, uh, has gone on to try to develop a brain scanner that can be used on infants to try to, to predict who will eventually develop autism, so that you can uh, do uh, therapeutic uh, approaches early in life to help with language development and other developmental augmentation protocols. Uh, another group is working on small uh, wrist-borne emotion sensors that could be worn and help people to anticipate where they're going to have a panic attack or a depressive episode so they can prepare their mind and anticipate what to do next. So we're really trying to get people to start ventures and to get innovation out into the world. And so our hope is that this is going to continue to progress. Um, and this year's class looks really exciting. We just had our midterm exams um, last week where people had to defend their ideas. We bring in venture capitalists and investors from the outside world, uh, and they are critiqued to hold them to the same standards as anybody, anybody would who is trying to bring a therapy to market or a diagnostic to market. Now, what is this going to look like going out many, many years into the future? I think what we're going to find is that we need to close the loop on the brain. Ideally, we can observe what's going on in the brain, but then we can analyze that information, figure out what it really means, and potentially compute the missing information and get it back into the brain. So we call this the brain coprocessor concept, and uh, it's really kind of the, the driving goal behind a lot of the technologies we're working on now. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see we're working on technologies, arrays of little tiny electrodes that we hope could eventually survey a vast fraction of the brain. And while it's an early stage um, endeavor, our hope is that eventually we could record the information that's distributed throughout emotion, decision-making, sensory, and motor circuits, such that we could try to extract that information and figure out what other information could be entered into the brain. Either to test a theory, we can enter some information and see what happens in, let's say, an animal model of a disorder, or in a normal brain, um, or we could try to augment the performance of that circuit, especially if circuits are uh, impaired in some way. And that's important. So far we've talked about how to correct neurons that are there. But what if the neurons aren't there? One of our hopes is that we could try to replace neurons that are lost by other kinds of computer. Uh, Hugh Hare at the Media Lab at MIT likes to say, replace parts of the body with parts that are easier to replace. And there's something to that. If we could take advantage of the incredible power of computing, uh, perhaps we could try to augment brain performance with silicon. And that's something that's already starting to happen. People have already started to develop closed-loop closed -loop stim stimulators, as they're called, which do a little bit of recording, analyze a little bit of the data, and then try to responsively stimulate the brain, although it's very, very early days. I think, though, that if we look out even just a few years, or if we think about looking many years out, there's going to be a huge impact on how we understand the human condition. And there's already some evidence of this. For example, it's slow because neuroscience progresses slowly sometimes. But if you look at the destigmatization of mental illness, it's gone from a topic which, you know, at one point was grounds for being confined into a, an asylum to something that uh, was treatable but people didn't talk about to something that now people openly discuss and has become uh, realized uh, to be an illness in the same way that other illnesses affect the body. Or, if you look at people's understanding of how people are responsible for their actions, you can see slow but steady changes, for example, in the criminal justice system, on how people who are mentally retarded or people who have uh, other kinds of, of uh, condition uh, are treated by the justice system in terms of how they are judged by uh, courts and by juries. So these are, are good things in terms of uh, how um, society is changing already, uh, slowly but steadily, in terms of understanding the nature of the brain and how it affects us. But I think what we're going to see in the years to come is that changes are going to happen beyond sort of these the formal institutions of medicine and justice and other arenas. We talked earlier about how uh, the sex study showed that stimulating a small area of the brain with, a, with magnetic pulses could alter how people judge the actions of others as being moral or not. And so one question is whether this will change how people regard the concept of morality itself. 
If it is something that is plastic, if it's something that can be altered by a change in the brain, does that give us a handle on it by revealing to us the processes that contribute to moral judgment? Or, on the flip side, does it change how people regard it as being something that is plastic and therefore not fundamental? Um, hope and motivation. We talked about how deep brain stimulation is being used in depressed patients. If we think about it, that's taking somebody who doesn't have hope, who is not motivated, who doesn't have energy, who doesn't um, seek to, uh, to, to do things in many ways, and activating um, you know, that electrode at 130 pulses per second is sufficient in many people who have undergone this procedure to restore hope and motivation. So what does that mean in terms of our understanding of hope and motivation? Does the fact that it is controllable by humans give us uh, strategies for either reconceptualizing it or augmenting it, or does it in some ways uh, change how it's perceived in a way um, to reduce it to, to smaller building blocks and thereby changing our concept of what these things mean? We talked about the comatose patient um, who is in, in a minimally, minimally conscious state who has some degree of responsivity restored by having electrodes implanted in, in his brain and was able then to respond to language and to start to um, uh, verbalize and to use objects again. So what does that mean if you can take an unconscious brain and through electrical pulses make it conscious again? If you think about it, this leads to all sorts of interesting conclusions. I mean, what does this mean for our ability to take other systems, like this computer that is running this little PowerPoint presentation? You know, what are the, the properties of matter that would um, yield the ability to make unconscious things conscious? And what are the fundamental limits on what those uh, properties of matter might yield in the future? I wanted to close on one story, which is about free will. Um, although the scientists involved with this study don't like it when, when people talk about it as free will. But I'll, I'll use it anyway, because I think it's important to, to try to understand how these different stories mesh. So there's a classic series of studies that go back many, many decades. And uh, in this set of experiments, what they do is they have somebody watch a clock, and the clock has a fast-moving hand that's rotating with time. And the experiment's very simple. They ask the subject to freely, whenever he or she wants, to decide to make a movement. For example, you could move your hand or your thumb or something. But when you decide to make, the, when you decide to make that movement, not at the time of the movement itself, but when you make the decision, remember where that clock pointed. Where was the hand pointing? And over the years, many groups have tried this experiment. If you record brain activity, whether with electrodes on the scalp or with brain imaging, or as was shown earlier this year, with electrodes in, in the brain of neurosurgical patients who volunteered to have electrodes put in their brain, you can often find neurons that will fire seconds before the person makes the conscious decision to move. So this raises questions about what is actually the causative agent in this sort of free will. Is it some unconscious uh, sub-process that initiates that decision? And then only after the fact are we aware that we made a decision. And how does this affect all the other things we've talked about? The consciousness of a decision, the morality associated with, with decision making. So these are challenging topics. And I think as new tools emerge, uh, we're in an era now where there's an incredible acceleration of exploration of the brain. And people are confident, confidently tackling these big questions that really cut to the heart of what it means to be human and to have thoughts and emotions and to have will and decisions and to do things that are good or bad. So I think I'll close on that note and we can discuss afterwards. Um, but I think it's something that we're very excited about and we're going to continue to try to invent strategies for solving some of these problems. So thank you. Okay, um, we are now going to move into some questions, and um, I, I think we can all agree, Ed, that uh, one of the things that was very exciting about your talk is the, um, the fact that your science is, is, is such an extraordinary thing in and of itself, but also <coughs> the um, empathy that you show and concern for people with these kinds of challenges is extraordinary. Um, 
You know, I, I made a bit of a tasteless joke at the beginning of this talk about agoraphobia, and I did it very deliberately because one of the things that's been discovered in terms of the use of humor is that if you get people to laugh at something that they later will hear about in a more serious context, an anxiety disorder, something of that sort, they will be more empathic about it. And as I looked at your slides earlier, I thought it would be an interesting thing to see how that connected. Um, so what we'd like to do now is to go through some questions that have come through from people here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the first question is, could cells in the brain be activated to increase certain types of intelligence, emotional, social, linguistic, sensual, for example, olfactory? So it's an interesting question. Uh, we talked earlier about how passing an electrical current across the brain um, has been shown to uh, increase uh, insight. There are also many papers that have shown that you can augment um, the permanence of memory by passing currents to the brain in a certain pattern. Um, people have found that if you stimulate the language area of the brain, you can increase uh, certain linguistic abilities, especially on the syntactic level. Um, and uh, uh, there's evidence that also by stimulating some of the frontal areas of the brain, that uh, the kinds of judgments that people make can be altered. For example, somebody who's often making very risky decisions um, if you stimulate the brain in, in the frontal areas in a certain way, you can actually get people to decrease their choice of higher risk decisions, and they'll pick more conservative ones. So um, I think it's already happening. I mean, in the, in the literature, people already have done at the basic science level studies on that. And as people start to investigate, investigate the clinical level, excuse me, problems like stroke and other problems where indeed uh, the impairment of brain function could affect intelligence, People are starting to explore, you know, if somebody's lost a language area, could we restore some plasticity, restore some change to the brain that allows that to be recapitulated? So the question of whether specific cells, on the other hand, are implicated in intelligence is still an open question. Most of the experiments done so far are on the regional level, and people are just now starting to try and figure out what cells are involved with in these computations. But I think in the next five or ten years, many groups will hone in on some of these cells. And there's already evidence uh, uh, that I think is going to be coming out over the coming couple years, um, that very specific pathways can affect cognition in profound ways. Okay. Um, what would you say is the definition of a mental illness? So currently in, in psychiatry and neurology, mental illnesses have very complex definitions. My hope would be that someday in the same way that we look for biomarkers of blood pressure or cancer or so on, that objective you know, molecular or electrophysiological markers could be defined. And that's starting to happen. For example, in epilepsy, you can look for patterns of electrical activity that indicate the kind of seizure that somebody has. And that electrical pattern can help govern the therapeutic avenue that's taken. That said, for a lot of mental illnesses, uh, the definition is complex. Usually, they are a constellation of symptoms that impair function in some way. Uh, for example, uh, depression and schizophrenia and some of these other uh, mental illnesses are defined by constellations of symptoms of which people have some subset. And usually, you know, one of the, the qualifiers is that it's also impairing the person's function in everyday life. Um, it's been widely noted that some of the properties associated with certain mental illnesses can be uh, even a benefit. For example, people with depression are often very realistic about their assessments of their abilities. Um, and uh, uh, in a way that others might not be. Um, and yet, amidst the constellation of all the symptoms, it can be incapacitating. But the symptom-driven definition, where people have you know, certain things like tiredness or you know, uh, uh, lack of motivation and so on, I think uh, hopefully over the coming you know, couple decades, will be replaced by objective definitions based upon brain activity, in the same way that we saw in the case of the depressed uh, patient earlier, knowing which circuits in the brain were impaired allowed a uh, treatment to be designed that then was able to help that person, you know, pretty much be, be cured as far as the, the depression scales go. So. Mm -hmm. uh, let me re remind everybody here, if you have cards that you filled out, do get them out to the side so we can get them down here to us. Um, if morality is a function of the brain, is it learned or innate? In other words, is it possible for someone to truly be born bad, as the old saying goes? 
So there's a lot of evidence for both innate and learned aspects of morality. Um, a lot of uh, thinking now on, on evolutionary theory um, and, and humans deals with how did we get our social infrastructure to allow us to function as a, as a society, as a civilization. And for that to work, there have to be certain kinds of expectations, such as trust, such as um, accountability, uh, in order for people to work together. Um, and so there's, uh, there's uh, uh, some evidence that in many species of animal, that they have certain kinds of uh, either transactional or other kinds of, of interface between one uh, member of the species and others that reinforce um, uh, even what appear to be altruistic or other kinds of, of behavior that have various moral uh, attributes. On the other hand, there's obviously a lot that's learned as well. And I think uh, one of the questions that's been very interesting in the, in the past several years is, you know, are there, there certain innate states that prevent learning? And the study of psychopaths, for example, has been very interesting, where people have tried to classify certain people as having fundamentally different physiology. You know, they might not, for example, react with revulsion to something that most people would regard as, uh, as absolutely terrible. And so hunting down whether that's due to genes or to specific events, though, is still an ongoing area of research, but uh, one of the most interesting ones, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one that, that really takes us into, a, I think, a, a very interesting area when people get concerned about, you know, there's always the element of what, well, what, how could research go wrong? What are, the, what are the unintended consequences of research? Mm -hmm. Are you worried about people abusing these potentials for military improvement, reducing fear potentials in soldiers, <clears throat> for example? It's a good question. So I think there's two important parameters and then one important conclusion. So one parameter is that our, our focus right now is very much on, on treating medical disorders. As we talked about in the beginning, though, as technologies have been tested and over time, are, if they are proof safe and efficacious, their uses can expand. I mean, the number of, uh, for example, antidepressants have been prescribed for many more things over the years than the original uh, diagnosis of major unipolar depression, for example. Um, so one aspect is just the idea that uh, our focus is on medical, but as, as technologies expand, they can certainly adapt to other uses. The second, though, is a societal one. You know, I think it's important to have you know, open, above-board dialogues about what we want our technologies to do and what we want them to do in service of our humanity. And that is something that's uh, important and driven by, by us um, as, as, a, as a society. For example, in our own research, all of our procedures that are done on on animal models, for example, are approved by a panel of lay people, veterinarians, um, you know, clinicians and scientists. Uh, and the question is always, you know, are we learning something fundamental and important? And as we start to look at these questions of treating humans as well, those very same questions are being asked. Does the risk justify, um, uh, is the, do the benefits justify the risks? Um, so I think for the case of, of military, uh, that's not really my area of expertise. Certainly they have adopted technologies um, that uh, others have not. I mean, I'm not an expert on it, but I've, I've seen examples of how they use certain uh, stimulants, for example, uh, to help keep people awake and alert in, in ways that mm -hmm. uh, uh, people around this room probably uh, don't. Um, and so the question, I think, is, you know, does the value system want that we set up, you know, do we want that to happen? Mm -hmm. That's a discussion that we need to, to have, especially during this time of accelerating change. Thank you. Um, you ought to see how the C C Cumberland farm sells Red Bull. Um, <laughs> would these up and coming technologies be able to help with disorders such as obsessive compulsive disorder or ADHD by using light to shut off cells? Good question. So actually, the, the Food and Drug Administration has already approved electrical implants for the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, obsessive compulsive disorder has also been effectively treated by making very, very, very tiny and, excuse me, and focal uh, lesions of the brain to try to interrupt perhaps some of the paths that, that cause that to occur. So I would certainly say that if more precise targets can be found um, at the cellular level, that might be of use for d either designing drugs that can target those cells to treat uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or potentially uh, you know, motivating new kinds of prosthetics. Uh, 
um, which you know, could in principle use the kinds of technologies that we've been talking about if the science continues to bear it out. For ADHD, um, that's also been an area where people have started to really try to understand what the circuits in the prefrontal cortex are doing that maintain attention. And that's an active area of research. Uh, so far, uh, most of the work on ADHD is focused um, you know, on uh, pharmacological or other you know, non-energy non delivering methodologies. Um, so. Okay. Um, this, this one relates to, it, it just talks about severe headaches, but we'll even take it into the realm of, of migraines, um, which is something that so many people uh, are debilitated by. And the question is, have practical replacements other than neuropharmological drugs been found for the treatment of severe headaches? Great question. So cluster headaches, you know, some of the most severe headaches that, that people can have, um, have on occasion uh, been treated through electrical stimulation of deep brain targets. And people have reported, uh, in some cases, some degree of relief. So um, now that, that deep brain stimulation has passed sort of these safety and efficacy milestones where you know, tens of thousands of people have, are, are walking around with those implants, people are starting to explore um, uh, conditions such as cluster headache. There's also a, I think it's a small company in California that's working on a migraine treatment that uses a magnetic pulse to try to disrupt the visual cortex in the back of the head. And the idea being that waves of activity that go across the visual cortex might be one of the potential triggers for the actual painful experience of a migraine. Um, I'm actually not a, uh, uh, remembering what the current status of that is, but I think they have a prototype device already made. Okay. When do you think we will be able to reverse engineer the brain? Well, that's sort of the, the big question, huh? I think, I think people are trying a couple different kinds of attempts now. People are trying to look at the structure of the brain. Could you try to find every connection and see how these cells make up circuits? People are trying to, um, you know, as we've talked about, to record the electrical activity of cells in the brain and then to test the causal role that a certain cell has by turning it on or off. It's quite possible, though, that at some point, maybe 5, 10, or 15 years from now, we'll find out that, hey, you know what? We've gotten as far as we can go with this level of description. Now we need to go at a, to a smaller level. Maybe instead of cells and circuits, we have to go look at molecules and figure out what the actual individual you know, building blocks are doing. Um, you know, if you look at the arc of neuroscience over the last century, um, there are many attempts to try to define a level of, of abstraction, you know, a level at which you can ignore things below that level of complexity and focus your attention on things above it. Uh, but the, the brain is a, a tough, tough customer. I wouldn't underestimate the brain. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go to a couple more questions here, and one of which is sort of a compilation of, of questions that were sent in by several of you. And um, they relate to, what, well, let's call it the Frankenstein phenomenon. And uh, it's, it's the question, one question is, what do you believe to be the greatest risk in researching brain augmentations farther? <clears throat> and along with that was people asking, do you, can you imagine a scenario in which you would have a Frankenstein-like effect? So it's the, um, you know, the, uh, what keeps you up at night? Uh, what is a Frankenstein-like effect, just to be clear? Well, when you, you, cre you create something that is, uh, I mean, essentially the whole idea is to create something that is, is to uh, give, give life, play God, uh -huh. and give life to something. Um, even the idea of bringing someone back and stimulating someone from a coma might be considered by some people mm -hmm. imbuing someone with life that it was not intended to be, depending uh -huh. upon one's beliefs. So the question is, are there circumstances in which you can imagine things going horribly wrong? That's really what people are looking at here. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly in the past, uh, they, they have. So, I mean, I think uh, in, in medicine in general, but for brain medicine specifically, um, you know, there have been all sorts of false starts and, and missteps and uh, technologies that seem cutting edge at one point are seen as, you know, terribly crude, you know, a short time afterwards. And so I think a couple of things are on everybody's mind. One is that people want to take every step possible to minimize risk. You know, there have been 
examples, like in the case of you know lobotomies and um, you know the use of uh, technologies in, in either inappropriate or, or misguided or just uh, scientifically incorrect ways that uh, ended up you know causing more harm than good. And those are uh, well in everybody's awareness, and people uh, are trying to take every step possible. I, I would hope to to avoid those things. I mean, certainly in our own work. You know, we're always trying to you know, make sure the science justifies anything before we go one step further, uh, even in the animal model experiments, much less than thinking about how to translate to humans. So, um, and, and even in recent history, though, you know, we, we talked about the fact that we're using a gene therapy to deliver these molecules into neurons. You know, there have been recent incidents in, in history, even within the last 10 to 15 years, where uh, gene therapy experiments have gone awry in humans. And, you know, there was the famous case, uh, uh, Jesse Gelsinger, who was a teenager who died in a gene therapy trial. Mm -hmm. So I think what's very important is to have both you know, extreme consideration of all the parameters, to make sure that always risk and benefit are being considered hand in hand. And you know, in, in the Gelsinger case, it was uh, particularly, I think, troubling because he, he was not uh, suffering a life-threatening illness and yet was you know, here on the, the front lines of a of a, of a trial, you know, if somebody is, you know, is out of hope, maybe they would volunteer for something in the, in the hopes of, of, you know, compassionate use of a technology. But if somebody is, you know, not having a problem, then they should not be allowed, perhaps, to, to be in that first line of, of, uh, of clinical trials. And so these kinds of, 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 of thinkings are very important and are certainly uh, being considered. And if you think about it, I didn't mention any times uh, when I was talking about all these things, and that was partly deliberate. Um, to give a sense of immediacy, but the first Parkinson's deep brain stimulation was 1986. And so it's been you know, well over two decades now in terms of the use, and it's been creeping up to the point where it was 10,000 and 20,000, and it's not like people went nuts and said, all right, let's just uh, you know, do whatever. But people are, be, are, are being very, very slow and incremental. And the flip side actually is true, that sometimes people are like, well, you know, I have this, this disorder, you know, why is it taking 25 years to, to get this out uh, at a large scale? And that has to be considered too. You know, there are a lot of brain disorders where, you know, uh, people need hope for, for things, and, and that has to be considered as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complex issue, and um, uh, I mean, all the decisions that we make are always done, you know, in consultation with a community of people, um, ranging from lay people to clinicians, and I think that's extremely important. Uh, and we're always conversing with people, you know, at the FDA. Um, you know, the European Union, Union has a commission on medical devices, and I was on a panel there. These are things that people discuss a lot, because I think it's important to try to anticipate these things. Um, but yeah, there are examples, even in recent history, that are at the front of everybody's mind, and everybody's trying to, I think, anticipate what the problems are, and to even try to anticipate what the unanticipatable ones are. But that's hard, of course. Well, bef before we move to this last question, which really is the crux of a lot of what we're doing with this entire colloquium, I think it's important to just draw attention to something that Ed has said repeatedly, and also you made these comments in the, when you met with the honor students today in the class. He was generous enough to meet with the students for, for an hour or an hour and a half, and uh, commented on several occasions about length of time and spoke in terms of, as he just did, two decades as a lengthy period of time. Whereas for many of us here, two decades doesn't seem terribly lengthy. You know, and I'm not just talking about age, I'm talking about our sense of time. Your sense of time, to me, appears phenomenally urgent. And, it, it, you know, I don't mean in a negative sense, but it's a remarkable thing, the way you think about time progressing um, within 20 years, expecting such extraordinary outcomes. So the question is, do you have any idea of what you will be doing, thinking about solving 10 years from now? Well, I try not to look out too far, because I think the world changes faster than you can, you can think. I mean, look back 10 years, right? 10 years ago, the human genome was barely finished. Um, uh, if you think about the kinds of microscopes that people use to look at the brain, or I mean, even human brain imaging, right? Functional MRI, um, which has now been used in perhaps a quarter million studies. Uh, that was only developed in like 1991 or so. And so that, that also is about 20 years old. Um, so these kinds of changes are happening pretty rapidly. 
but it also means that it's hard to, to plan out too fast. I mean, part of why I talked about the curators and the network is that we want to be very dynamic. You know, if we need to go after robotics to solve a problem, we'll go learn about robotics. If we need to go, you know, look at plant genomes in order to find better photosynthetic molecules, we'll go learn genomics. So I think what we're trying to do is almost a meta level of prediction. We might not know what's going to happen 10 years from now, but can we know what we need to do to get there and so that we're prepared for it? And I think that's really the crux of it, is that we want to be able to have incredible, moment incredible momentum, but also the incredible ability to steer towards you know, the eventual goal, which is to really understand what's going on in the brain and to help you know, cure these folks. So. Well, we, I think this has probably been one of the most fascinating evenings we could possibly have spent. And thank you so very, very much. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's, um, it's very exciting for us to know that the cluster of individuals that Ed is working with and where he's located himself is just really an hour and a half from here, which is extraordinarily exciting. And uh, the fact that we're starting a program here at the University of Rhode Island is, I think, equally exciting. And hopefully, there'll be opportunities for partnering um, in some time in the future. Mm -hmm. I do want to remind you all that next week, social media with Deb Roy and Joanna Blakely. And um, so tweet your friends, put, <laughs> post something on your Facebook wall. If you don't have a Facebook wall, build it quickly. <laughs> so right. um, again, let's give Ed Boyden another big round of applause for an extraordinary <laughs> night. That was a great talk. Oh, thank